So this is part of what we call a financial revolution. And it goes next week as well. So I, I did cover quite a bit last service. I know some of you weren't here last service. We're kind of just giving a little brief summary of where, why I'm here, what, what gives me the right to be here as far as what, what, I, what I've done, I would know. But, um, you know, for nine years, I, I grew up in New Albany, and for nine years, when uh, Drinda and I moved here, we were broke. I mean, broke. I mean, broken. Broke and broken. <laughs> I mean, we had uh, 10 maxed out credit cards, nine uh, three company finance company loans at 30 some percent we had the irs money back taxes liens on our properties that we didn't own but you know they put liens on things um, i was having panic attacks i was on antidepressants and yet i've been to uh or Arbor university i have a theology degree i have a year of bible school uh, the pastor that ordained us in tulsa was raymond graduate and taught faith and yet uh, here we were going bankrupt and i was sick in fact, uh, the doctors, um, I was having panic attacks and all kind of issues. The doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with me. And at that point in time, besides being in serious debt, I didn't know if I'd live or die. I mean, really, that's, that's where we were. And you'd say, for nine years, how could, why would you live that? How could you live away for nine years? It's a long time. Well, that's what I wanted to know, right? It's like, you know, I, I couldn't answer it. But I want to give you a, an insight. One day the Lord spoke to me and said, you're in this mess because you never learned how my kingdom operates. And we began to study the kingdom. A kingdom is the king's dominion, it's laws, a government. The, God's kingdom operates by laws. And we hear Jesus say in the Bible, this is what the kingdom of God is like. He's about to talk to you and illustrate laws. Now, when you come into the kingdom, you heard what I said on the video, uh, you already have the kingdom. If you're born again, you have the kingdom. You are a citizen of the kingdom. You have legal rights in the kingdom. And so I said, stop your begging, uh, because that is unbelief. It means simply you don't understand the kingdom. If you went to a court of law and started begging the judge, that would show you know very little about law. Is that right? I mean, it's a, it's a legal issue. If someone was trying to steal your house, you would boldly go into court and demand that you have the, the deed and this, the squatter get off of your property, right? Well, this is exactly how the kingdom of God operates. If you do not know how it operates, you'll let the devil run over you, steal from you, give you any sickness he wants to give you, uh, cause you to be broke and hopeless and in depression. But that is not you in the kingdom. So, you know, how do these things work? Our life was changed. I'm just going to show one picture. If you have not seen this, just to give you a little of a bump because I want to bounce off of some reality here of what actually the kingdom does. But then you need to get last service to kind of, learn more about what I've said to intro this that you missed. But our daughters put Amy's picture up. You know, the kingdom changed our life completely. We got out of debt. We began to create businesses, able to give hundreds of thousands of dollars away. We're now millionaires, not because of us. For nine years, I couldn't pay my bills. So I'm not obviously that good, right? <laughs> so you need to ask, okay, how did you do this? I mean, how, how did, why do you have a show on every time, time zone in the world called fixing the money thing. If, uh, you know, how, how did this all happen? Well, here's our daughter. The kingdom, understanding the kingdom changed everything. It was like a switch came on. And we began to prosper and change and get out of debt and create, uh, you know, I always say it takes provision to have vision. Provision, it's pro. Provision is pro vision. You have no money, you have no vision except to escape and to survive one more week. You know, look to Friday night, vacation, retirement, five o'clock. You know, most people, most people dream of quitting instead of going. Their, their vision of becoming a millionaire means they can stop doing something yeah. instead of doing something. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't, have, they don't have a vision. They have no passion. Most people hate their jobs. 70% of people don't like their jobs. 30-some percent hate their jobs. And so why do you go to work? Because you're slaves. You have to. Right. This is not how God created you to live. Right. Adam had no concern or worries in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus came to restore what Adam lost. And I'm telling you firsthand that the kingdom of God will literally change your life. And you say, I don't understand. I understand you don't understand. I didn't understand. God said you don't understand. But it changed your life. So here's our daughter. This pictures are eight hours apart if you've never seen this. Daughter had a tumor in her abdomen. These pictures are eight hours apart. I tell you to stare at it and look at it because... I had never seen this kind of stuff happen. But she began to understand the kingdom that healing was legally hers. Not by feeling, 
She didn't have to feel saved. She didn't have to feel. You don't have to feel to be a citizen, right? right. I feel like a United States. You don't, you're a citizen legally if you feel like it or not, right? right. So you don't have to feel. This is a legal issue. So she began to learn that healing was legally hers. And she began to meditate on that and the scriptures of God's word that promises that. And so we laid hands on her. Two weeks later, she went to bed like on the left and she woke up like on the right. Now, she does not look anything on the right like she looked like on the left. And she's our worship leader. She's our firstborn of five. And so when she stood before the church, like on the right, you can imagine the church, their mouths fell open. And they said to her, did you get a new body? And she would say, yes, I did. Because they had, most people had never seen this before. You see, Jesus said, if you don't believe what I say, believe at least because of the the miracles that you've seen. So here's here's the deal. If the Bible is true, there should be evidence. Is that right? I mean, if it's true, if it really means what it says, we should have evidence. That is my my passion, is I want to make sure people understand it is true, (laughs) and it's yours. So she was healed as she slept. She didn't know. She just woke up, and she was different. And that tumor, 13-pound tumor, disappeared instantly, and nine inches in her waist and her back, which was twisted and knotted, instantly healed. And we have a picture of her spine here. On the, on the left, you'll see the spine. You'll see the mass, uh, twisted spine, straight, knotted. And when she woke up, we had this x-ray taken the week she was healed, completely reformed, curved, natural bend. The, the mass is gone, and she has uh, four children today, and she is our worship, still our worship leader, our daughter. And then I just, since Alicia's here, it's our, our son's daughter, we put her picture up. She's telling her story of how she was healed of a massive tumor the size of a grapefruit where she went to the James uh, the, the hospital and it, the first thing they said, you have three or four months to live. Just like Amy, her tumor disappeared overnight. Neither one had chemotherapy, neither had surgery. They believe what God said. So I said to the first service, I'll say to you, you have to answer how did that happen? Now, the biggest thing that changed my life was realizing God said, he told me one day, you're in this mess because you don't know how the kingdom operates, which is laws, okay? The kingdom is laws. It's a government, has laws. The greatest revelation I've had in the beginning when he said, you need to learn how the kingdom operates, it's laws. Stop begging. I don't beg. Do I drop? How many times is this going to fall? If I did it 2,000 times, would it keep falling? How about 3 million? It's a law. It works every time. So the kingdom is based on laws. If you can learn the laws, you can duplicate the law, right? You don't beg the power company to turn the lights on. We understand the laws. But you learned growing up. You learned growing up. You had to find the switch if the lights weren't on, correct? But where's the switch for the kingdom? See, most people don't know how to access it. I mean, I can read the stories. And my problem, how can I get heaven to show up? How can I get the stories I'm seeing to show up in my life? I mean, my pastor said, you know, this is God's will that you're, you know, he taught the word, but yet it wasn't showing up. My quest was, I can see the stories, but how do I get it to show up? Where's the switch at? You know, where's the switch? And so we're going to study that today. So get your Bibles out, and we got a lot to cover. I talk fast, you can listen fast. So that's awesome. This is life changing stuff. Life changing stuff. Kingdom of God. All right. Let's look at Luke chapter 8. And we find here a very famous story. I'm sure your pastor, by the way, uh, your pastor is a great, they're a great couple. They teach faith, they teach the kingdom. And I'm sure that uh, this would be a great church to attend if you are in the area. I would recommend, highly recommend that. Uh, Luke chapter 8. Let's dig into the kingdom. You know, Jesus always said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Remember? Why is he saying that? Because he's trying to illustrate this invisible kingdom of how it works. So they can duplicate it. He says, the same things you see me do, you will do. So he's he's a teacher. He's demonstrating and teaching. That's what his ministry is. And that's what I'm doing here today. We're going to teach and demonstrate. All right, Luke chapter 8, verse 42 We have a crowd here around Jesus, and it says, as Jesus was on his way, crowds almost crushed him. 
And a woman is there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately she was healed. Now Jesus said, who touched me? And when they all denied it, Peter said the obvious, Master, they're press, everyone is pressing against you. What, are you. what are you talking about? Everyone is touching you. He said, oh, no, no, I felt the anointing flow from me. The woman then, realizing what had happened, comes up before Jesus and admits it was her. And then Jesus says to this woman in verse number 48, a very important phrase that you need to understand. It says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Now, you need to answer the question why other people weren't healed because they were all touching him, and I can assume with Jesus' fame that many were sick or needed healing. Would you not agree? Okay. But yet here's this woman, and she tapped into the flow of the anointing and was healed. I need you to tell me why they weren't healed and why she was healed, and here's why. Because someday you may need the anointing, you may need to tap into the kingdom. You need to know where the switch is at. You need to know how to turn the switch on when you need it. Now, these stories are written to tell you that, but most people do not read the Bible that way. When God told me that I needed to learn how the kingdom operates, I began to read every story. Why did that happen? How did that happen? I became a spiritual scientist trying to observe and understand the laws. See, most people say it's Jesus. But Jesus did it. See, you need to understand, Jesus laid aside his former glory, and he was ministering as a son of man. He had to be baptized uh, by the Holy Spirit at the River Jordan before he did his first miracle. Okay, so he's, he's acting, he's going to operate just like you will. The kingdom. All right. So you have to answer the question. You can't duplicate what you can't teach, I always say. If you can't teach it, you can't enjoy it. Now, people see things happen. A lot of Christians will see things happen, but they don't understand why it happened. So they can't duplicate it. Right? Are you with me? Okay. Uh, so let's examine this as a scientist. What, what can we find out here that will tell us how this works? Well, we understand, first off, that Jesus called her daughter. Now, what does that tell you? She is an Israelite. She is of the nation of Israel. More importantly, she is a, a daughter of Abraham and has a legal right for healing. There was healing in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. So we now know that it was legal. See, to understand all of this, what I'm saying, you have to understand what I call the jurisdiction issue, which answers so many questions that people say, why wasn't that person healed? Why was this person healed? You know, I prayed for my grandma for three years and she died. Well, you don't have authority over your grandma. You follow me? Jesus came to preach the word. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, it says he could not heal them. Do you know that Jesus could not heal people? If you ask anyone on the street, can Jesus heal whoever he wants to, the answer they would say is yes, and the answer is actually no. But more importantly, you need to answer why couldn't he heal them? Mark chapter 6 says why. Their unbelief, their lack of faith. Why is faith required for God to move in the earth realm? Because he gave the earth to Adam and Eve. He gave the earth realm to, to men and women. They hold jurisdiction over it. Thus, God has to work through people, and so does Satan, because people have legal jurisdiction here. All right? So there's so many things I can talk about the jurisdiction issue, but that's one of the first things when you learn law, we learn jurisdiction, right? We know that a, a police officer has jurisdiction, or his law has legality in a certain sphere or place. And so you can have one police officer on a corner, and that's his jurisdiction, and this police officer in a corner, that's his jurisdiction. And this guy, even though he's dressed in a police uniform, looks like a police uniform, knows the law like a police officer, goes over here to this other guy's jurisdiction, guess what? He doesn't have any power there. Even though he knows, looks, and smells like a police officer, he has no power. All right? So the jurisdiction issue is huge. It answers all the questions that you need to understand that people say, well, I guess God did it. I guess God knows best. I mean, he killed the person, you know. I mean, it must have been their time to die. No, you have to dig below that because the Word of God says, if anyone is sick among you, you're in anyone. If anyone is sick, call the elders. They'll pray for them, the prayer of faith, and they shall recover. I mean, so the Bible's very clear, but you have to understand the legal side of the kingdom to have the answers that you need. 
So first off, I always tell people this. If something happens that doesn't match what the Bible says, it's never God's fault. It's always a short circuit on this end. Okay? So you become a student of the kingdom. So the Bible says she's a daughter. So we know that heaven had jurisdiction. Faith, I'm going to talk about faith today. But So we know that heaven had jurisdiction, like the power lines connected to your house, the power's on, but the lights are still out. What would you do? You would look for the switch. First thing, right? All right, so where's the switch? We know the power's on. He said, daughter, the power's on. But then he said something that you need to understand. He said, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Your faith. Now, the word faith is a Christianese type of word that most people have no clue what it is. They would simply say, it means I believe what God says. That's true in a very brief analysis, but we have to understand faith to really understand or understand how it works. In other words, you can have mental assent to what God says and not be in faith. So what is faith? We have to get into this because I want to know how she received. Now, I understand this. Let me ask you this. Jesus said she came, or the Bible says, she came up behind him. He did not know she was there. So he was not choosing to minister to her. Is that right? So whose decision was it to receive healing? Hers or Jesus's? Thank you. Whose decision is it that you receive? <clears throat> Yours. Thank you. So, we need to move on. So, let's answer some questions. What is faith, first off? We have to understand that. What is faith? Now, there's various uh, definitions. Most people quote Hebrews. You know, faith comes by hearing the Word of God and hearing by the Word of God. You know, it comes by hearing. And it does come by hearing the Word of God, but still, it doesn't tell me what faith is. Or how, you know, I need to know how this works. My definition of faith is found in Romans chapter 4 talking about Abraham, who is the father of our faith, and examining how did Isaac show up? Remember, Sarah couldn't have babies. It was actually impossible for her to have babies, yet Isaac showed up. And so the Bible tells us how Isaac showed up. Romans chapter 4, um, verse 18, of course, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, because it was impossible to have babies. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be, without weakening in his faith. Now, I'm looking for a definition of faith here. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith. And I'm reading the NIV, NIV 1984 version, in case you're wondering. Uh, he did not weaken in his faith, being, verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. Now here's the definition of faith. Being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he says and, he, and the will to do it. It, it. It's his will. Being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he says. Being fully persuaded. That's the definition of faith. Being fully persuaded. Fully persuaded. So, What's, why is faith needed? Because I just said God gave the earth realm to people and he can't just come busting in here. It would not be legal. All right? How did Satan gain access into the earth realm? He had to go through the door. The door was Abram. I mean, Adam. Right? Satan had no jurisdiction here. They had complete authority over him. He lusted after that authority. He couldn't take it from them. So he deceived them out of it and brought all mankind under the judgment that he was headed towards called hell. So, he knew to gain legal access into the earth realm, he had to go through the door, the, whoever had the key, and that was Adam. And then God had to gain access back into the earth to rescue his creation. He had to find a man to grant that. His name is Abraham. So through Abraham's lineage, through Abraham who believed God, he made covenant with Abraham which is a legal, legal covenant contract that, made, that was a legal doorway for heaven to operate, and Jesus had to come through that door. That's why the lineage, the genealogy, is recorded in the first chapter of, of the New Testament that proves that Jesus came through Abraham's lineage, which made it legal. It's recorded in the Bible in front of Satan 
so he cannot argue it, that Jesus legally could come into the earth, into his territory, because now Satan's called the God of this world, little g, remember? Even Paul calls him that in 1 Corinthians, because he was given Adam's jurisdiction over the earth realm, and people came under Satan's jurisdiction. Is that making sense? Okay, I'm talking, talking fast. Now, so this woman, because she's an heir of Abraham, it's legal for healing to take place. But now her faith, the switch, we're talking about the, the faith. So we now know what the definition of faith is, being fully persuaded. We know why faith is required. We now know why in Mark 6, Jesus could not heal because they were not in faith. Heaven had no legal jurisdiction to heal them. Heaven could not, could not move through that legality. Jesus can't, God can't make you say yes to Jesus. Right? Everyone has to say yes. The Bible says every man, woman, and child must ratify what Jesus did by saying yes personally because you have jurisdiction here. Now, let's move on. Um, Romans 10.10, 10, let's mention, I think this is a great illustration. Romans 10.10 10 says, if we believe, we are, we believe in our heart, we are justified. This is how we were all born again, right? You know Romans 10.10. 10. If I believe in my heart, I'm justified, and then we confess unto salvation. Remember that scripture? Okay, let's examine that. I believe in my heart, I'm justified. Now, justified is a legal term meaning administration of law. So I believe what heaven says. I'm in faith. I believe what heaven says. It's now, I'm justified. It's now legal for heaven to invade earth. But notice the sentence does not stop there. Nothing happens yet because I have jurisdiction. It says, so I believe God. I'm in faith. It's now legal then I confess. Who has jurisdiction? I do. Then I confess. I release that authority unto salvation. So that's the process. Where's the key? The interface of heaven and earth is your heart. Everything goes through your spirit, your heart. All right? So that's what faith is. Faith is required for heaven to legally flow into the earth realm and if you're in agreement with heaven and you release that anointing, heaven can flow through you into the earth realm. But listen, here's a problem, though. Here's the problem. How, people think they're persuaded. They think they're in faith and they're not. So how do you know if you're in faith? You, this is vital. You need to know if you're in faith so you can make a decision to get in faith or you won't make stupid decisions when you're not in faith, which is fear. You need to recognize, how do I know if I'm in faith or not. All right, let me, I use this example. Now, this Bible is burgundy or maroon, but let's say I told you that it was hunter fluorescent orange. Okay? And I'm, I'm convinced of it. And I'm saying, look, okay, Pastor Tom and Kathy had me up here. They trust me, and I'm here to tell you today, this is not burgundy or this, this is hunter orange. And I've done some research. Crayola, you know the company? They had it in for you. They, they changed all the colors. This is really hunter orange, fluorescent orange. What would you say? And I said, okay, I understand this is kind of a shock to you. Give me a couple days. I'll teach. I'll come back maybe five or six weekends in a row, Pastor Tom, and I'll just stay on this topic until your church gets it. How many would get it? And if I said that, how many are nervous that you learned the colors wrong? <laughs> oh, my goodness, we learned Crayola colors wrong. It's Maybe the sky's purple. Maybe it's black. I don't know. Why aren't you nervous about that? Because you are fully persuaded that this is burgundy. There is no rouse of mental ascent of confusion or fear. You go, matter of fact, that you're the one that has it wrong, Gary. Well, no matter what Tom says about you, this is burgundy. Right? Now, that is what it feels like when you're fully persuaded. The doctor says, you're going to die. <laughs> right. You follow me? So you're fully persuaded there is no emotional response. It's like, whatever you think. Fine. Yeah. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we put our armor on. It's all based on the Word of God. Every piece is based around the Word. But we have the shield of faith, right? Remember the shield of faith, part of our armor? 
the shield of faith. Now, translate that into what I just said, the shield of being fully persuaded. And it says it quenches every fiery dart, which is the thought that is countering what God says. So if this shield of being fully persuaded is out there, nothing can get past it. Because, notice, the shield is not here. It's outside of my body. It doesn't even enter into my mental thought process. It's quenched, you know, a candle. It puts it out before I even pick it up. That's what faith is. Now we're beginning to understand that maybe I haven't been as faith in faith as much as I thought, right? Fear is not faith, friend. Fear does not mix with faith. If you're anxious about something, you are not in faith. Because faith is fully persuaded like, oh, this, <laughs> this gravity is going to hold me here. I'm not moving. It's done. And it talks one way. It's, it's over. It, it, it doesn't even enter into your, into your mind. All right, so now that you understand that most of the time people are not in faith, and they think they are, the most important thing is how do I get in faith? But notice I want you to recognize when you're not in faith so that you know you need to get in faith. Is it helping you? Y'all got this? Okay. Now remember, this is life and death. That whole crowd, they would have liked that, but only she had the faith. Okay, so let's move on. Dig into this. All right, so Mark chapter 4 is the most important chapter in the Bible. I didn't say it, Jesus did. In verse 13, Jesus said, if you do not understand basically this chapter, you'll not be able to understand any other chapter. Why is that? In this chapter are three stories that illustrate how the human spirit comes into agreement with what heaven says. And that's called faith. When you, your human spirit comes into agreement, fully persuaded of what heaven says, and most of you have experienced this, when you had this statement, I just knew that I knew that I, I knew that I knew, I, I just knew that I knew, that's what faith says. You, you don't, you know, there's a process, you know, it's, maybe you couldn't define it, but you, Maybe experienced it, fully persuaded. Now, let's look at Mark chapter 4. Again, there's three stories, famous stories. The parable of the sower is there. The parable of the mustard seed are there. And then Jesus explains the parable because the disciples didn't understand what he's saying. And we need to look at this. Okay. Mark, not Matthew, Mark 4, okay. Now, again, the whole chapter is, th is basically talking about how agreement happens, how your heart, your spirit, comes into agreement with heaven. And so he tells us the parable of the sower. I won't read the, the first round. He tells the parable, you know, the seed on the hard path and the seed, you know, the it sprouts. You know, you know the story, probably. And they said, uh, we don't understand that. So then he explains it. I'm going to start with his explanation of the story of the parable in verse 26. Mark 4, 26. And by the way, I tell my church, if you throw your Bible in the air, it should always land open at Mark 4. Now, I'm serious. You have, let me say it this way. What is in Mark chapter 4 is not an option play. This is, you have to, you must understand Mark chapter 4. You have to know this. All right, so let's examine it. Verse 26. He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Oh my, that's it. He said what? This is, He's going to tell you about this invisible kingdom. Whenever he says that, you get your pencil and paper out. This is how the kingdom operates, is what he's saying. A man or woman scatters seed. Now, in the previous parable of the sower story, he defined the seed as what? The Word of God. On the ground, the ground was defined as the heart or the spirit of, of men, the men, the spirit. The God part of you that's there. This, okay. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Your spirit incubates whatever you put in it. All right? You don't know how it happens, but the devil does. This is why you go to a movie and you think, this is a great movie, but it had that one scene that's all the devil needs to catch your attention. 
and meditation. In James chapter, I don't remember the actual chapter right now, I think it's one, says that when you begin to meditate on something, it drags you towards completion. It drags you towards completion. All right, so night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts, grows, though he doesn't know how, all by itself, the soil, and the soil is what? Your spirit produces grain. So you can't pray for faith. Faith is a natural response of your spirit with the Word of God. You can't pray for faith. I'm just telling you how faith comes, okay? Jesus says, all by itself, your heart produces grain. It's going to incubate the seed of the Word. First the stalk, then the head it grows. So you're not in faith when it's there growing. That's when the enemy attacks that seed because you have no evidence to verify it yet. You with me? There's always a time period between there it is, amen and there it is. Now, so Satan knows that's the vulnerable part. If he can get you to let go of the seed, now the seed is imperishable, the Bible says. It, it doesn't fail. But the enemy knows that. He's got to try to convince you it's not working, nothing's happening. But you have to hold on to the Word with the picture of the result in front of you. Okay, first the stalk, the head, then the full, cor- full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, now let's define ripe. What he is saying to an agricultural society is, if I take a kernel of corn and I plant it in the ground, when it is mature and ripe, the seed in the ear of corn will match the seed that I planted identically. It'll taste the same, look the same, be the same, identical, right? You can't tell the difference. Now, the seed he's talking about is not the kernel of corn. He's using it as an example. He's talking about the Word of God. The Word of God from heaven puts the Word of God into a human, a human spirit who has legal, legal jurisdiction in the earth realm. They take that Word and meditate on it all by itself. That seed in your spirit begins to produce agreement. It's not agreement yet. You've got to hold to that Word And all by itself, it's going to come to maturity. And when it's mature, the seed, or let me say it this way, the thoughts, or even better yet, all you see is the same plants. In other words, I sow a kernel of corn. When it's mature, the mature plant matches the seed. The seed from heaven, sown into the heart, when it's mature, all I see in my heart is what heaven says. Now, Jesus actually told a second story here in in verse 30 about the mustard seed. Though it be the smallest seed in the garden, it becomes the largest. And when it is mature, it will shade and hold the birds of the air. Meaning that, although it be the smallest, your garden's full of weeds, when you let that seed grow in your heart, there'll be a come a day when you look at all you can see is what God says. You won't see sickness. You won't see poverty. When you, when you look and you think, all you, all you see is what God says. And when that happens, you go, that's done, that's done, it's taken care of. I got it. It's, it's, I got it. You know what? It may not even change yet, in the natural yet, but you got it. And now you're speaking it and releasing it. Okay? Now, Jesus is teaching this. So this is how faith comes. So if you find you're in fear, what are you going to do? You're going to get the word out. You're going to write them on three-by-five cards or whatever you need to do to keep that in front of you. You're not going to Google your situation. Don't give the enemy ammunition. You're going to go to God first, and you're going to get the Word of God on that topic, and you're going to write it down. Years ago, I was in a, a church in South Ohio, and I, was, I wasn't even pastoring, but I was learning these principles and not really understanding them yet, but the pastor's mom was there who gave me great illustration. After service, I was talking about finances and getting out of debt, and uh, they had me over to the, the parsonage after service, and his mother, probably in her, maybe around 80, late 70s, had made this wonderful apple pie. Of course, I like apple pies. And we had apple pie and ice cream, and so she cut a big piece. We all had pie. And she said, I'd like to have a second piece. These are pretty good-sized pieces of apple pie. She's like 80. And I'm looking at it. We're all kind of looking at her. And she's, oh, I know. you. I just can't get enough sugar, she said. Really? See, I was a diabetic for 20-some years. I was in and out of the hospital. Almost died many times. 
until I began to see what God said about healing. And I realized healing was already legally mine. I took a three-by-five card. I wrote three scriptures on healing, and I read it every day when I ate breakfast, lunch, and supper. And in 30 days, I started getting sick. I went to the doctor, and they said, well, you're sick because you're taking this insulin. Get off the insulin. You don't need it anymore. And from that day on, she said, feed me the pie. <laughs> but see, she did exactly what we're talking about. She understood that she's going to stand on the Word, meditate on it, and knowing, not knowing how, that is going to produce agreement with heaven, which is faith, and she'll have what heaven says. You with me? Covering it fast. All right. So now let's look at this. This is the part people don't get, which we just mentioned how it works, but we follow it down through here. When the full kernel is in the head, as soon as the grain is ripe, that tells you that it matches what was sown. There's faith there, right? When it's ripe, it'll look exactly like the seed I planted, correct? Right? I need to hear some yeses, or I'll start all over again. Because, because you have to have this. All right. Now, the person's in faith. They're fully persuaded. The seed matches what heaven says. But like I said, Romans 10.10, nothing happens until... You release that authority because you have jurisdiction. So that's why Jesus says right here, head is ripe, grain's ripe. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Same illustration, different, different things, but the same thing. Faith is there, but he has to harvest that faith. He has to release that anointing. Now, we all know what a sickle is, right? Quite frankly... Uh, I had never really heard a, a, a message preached about the sickle, really. I mean, all my career, you know, church and everything, I never heard, today we're going to preach on the sickle. Now, quite frankly, if the sickle is required to catch the harvest or harvest the harvest, I think we need to talk about it, yeah. right? We need to know how to do this. Yeah. So let's talk about it. All right. So we know the harvest is ripe. He puts the sickle to it. He has the jurisdiction in the earth realm. And uh, we're going to talk, how does he do that? I mean, obviously, how, how do we actually release that sickle? Or how do we capture the harvest? We need to understand that. So I didn't really understand. I mean, I was teaching faith for a long time until one day God brought this to my attention. Uh, you don't, you're not finishing the story. I mean, I would talk how you get into faith, but I would, one day, I, wait a minute, there's more to this story. I, I stopped before it ended. The sickle, what, you know, how's that work? So we have, we, we sow, we've, we're givers like you are. We've, we sowed, um, I don't know, eight cars away probably, you know. And uh, so this one, one uh, pastor in Atlanta was feeding 10,000 people a month. I went down to visit him. And he was driving a dilapidated, ser seriously dilapidated pickup truck. I mean, Quite frankly, it had no starter in it. He had to coast it downhill to start it. And I said, you mean to tell me that you are feeding these people and this is the example they see of what God looks like? I said, we're not having that. I called Drenda. I said, we had, we had an extra car. I said, Drenda, I just gave our car, car away. And she was fine with that. Usually I don't do that, but God, you know, she trusts me. And I said, I'm going to send the car down because you need to be an example to these people of what heaven looks like, right? He's not a pauper. So I had a car, it was like less than a year old, and maybe, I don't know, I had 15,000 miles, maybe around 15,000 miles on it. So um, her brother came, and he was going to drive it down uh, to this pastor. And I understood how the kingdom works, thought I did. So I laid my hands in that car, and I said, Father, I release this car into the kingdom of God. And I know, I'm sowing a seed. I said, and I receive. Now, you know, bread in the Bible multiplied to, and oil to, and fish to, and cars too. Okay. Now, you know money, you can name money because it's the bartering system. See, I can either go buy the fish and sow the fish, or I can sow the money and name it fish. Right? Okay. So I, I went, and Father, I'm, I released this, and then I receive, and I stop because I, I'm not really a car guy. I just said, I'll get back to you on that. That's what I said. So Drew and I were talking one day, and she was thinking about a, a different car. And I said, what kind of car do you want? She says, I don't know. She said, you know, maybe a convertible would be nice. 
Oh, it'd be cool. You drive around a convertible. It'd be cool. Next question should be, what convertible do you like? And we, she says, I don't know. I said, I don't know either. I haven't looked around at convertibles. I don't know what's out there. But I said, you know, I made a mental note that uh, she said convertible. So we go to lunch one day at this strip mall, probably a Chinese restaurant, probably, <laughs> knowing me. And uh, so all of a sudden, we're sitting in the car, and my nice, sweet wife yells, that's it! What is it? <laughs> I had to dodge her fingers. That's it! What? That's the, that's the, that's the convertible I want. That's, that's it. Okay, well, it's, it's clear across the lot, so we drove over there, I pulled behind it. It is a 645CI BMW convertible. I said, I said, I said you got pretty good taste. <laughs> <laughs> I knew they were not cheap, right? But uh, I made a note of that, okay? So maybe two weeks, three weeks later, a guy calls me in the church. We have not told anyone that she was looking for a convertible. No one. Guy calls, here's the first thing he says. I found Drinda's car. I said, excuse me? I found Drinda's car. I said, what do you mean? Well, I was driving down the road, and God's, I saw this car, and God told me it was Pastor Drinda's. Well, what kind of car was it? I was a 645 CI BMW convertible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was mint. It was two, like two years old, and uh, we got it for $28,000. I mean, it was perfect. And she still, I think I have a, there it is. Still have it today. I tell her, Drenda, sell the car. It's like 20 some years old or whatever. She goes, No, I love that car. <laughs> but yeah, it still looks good. They have good paint jobs on BMWs. It's been outside for 20 years. It still looks like that. Anyway, what's my next question going to be? How did that happen? Right? How did it happen? Now, here's what I learned. I put the sickle in. I'd given eight cars away, but I never said, I am receiving this car. Never said that. But I said, that's it. I said, wait a minute. Okay, I said, that's it. Walking through uh, Cabela's. You know, I like to hunt. We got a big marsh, like 15 acres of marsh on our property, and I kept seeing these flocks of ducks landing every year, and I thought, I'm going to go down there and get me a duck dinner. So I went down, you know, I had my old trusty shotgun I had since I was like 20 years old and got a couple ducks. But then someone told me they have shotguns made just for duck hunting that are camouflaged, and they hold bigger shells. You can get shoot longer range. And I said, oh, that's cool. I was walking through Cabela's after duck season was over, like in January, and sure enough, there's a whole rack. It said waterfowl guns. I didn't even know such things existed. And without thinking about it, I said out loud, I don't know, involuntarily, I, just, I wouldn't even think, I, I mean, I noticed I'd like to have one of those. I just said, Father, I'll take that one. That's all I said. About a month later, I was invited to speak at a corporate event, not church event, a corporate event, and the, the CEO, essentially, of this company comes out after I spoke and said, we wanted to buy you a gift for speaking, and they brought out that exact shotgun. Now, my question to you is, is what? How did that happen? We are, we drive Honda, we drove, driven Hondas all our life. In fact, I drove my little Ridgeline truck up here today. But we rented a Escalade for the women's conference to drive our guests around and never had driven in Escalade. And uh, they said, hey, the conference is lasting tomorrow. I want you guys to drive it home and see if you like Escalade. So we drove it home. We were going to drive it back the next day for the conference. And we said, well, this is pretty cool. And I, Honda Pilots are nice, but I have to admit the Escalade was a little nicer. And it was a short version. It was pearl white. It's beautiful. And we said, remember, I'd given eight cars away. We said without even thinking what we were doing. You know, we, we like this. We need to get one. What, and I said, what color do you want? She said, I like the white. I said, what version? Do you like the long, like the big long version? Or they make the shorter, like, you know, the, what's it called? The, not the Escalade version, but the Suburban and the uh, Tahoe. You know, they make them different lengths. We were driving the short version, and it was nimble. You know, I like that. I didn't like the big long one. I said, Let's, I, said I like the short one. 
That's all we said. I don't know, a month, three weeks go by. Guy calls me on my cell phone in my church and says, no, we didn't tell anyone. He says, I'd like to buy you an Escalade. What color do you want? Uh, white. We like, the, we like the pearl white. Okay, I'll get it. Nothing, you know, I didn't hear from him for over a month. I can't call him up and say, hey, where's that free Escalade at, right? <laughs> he, finds, he calls and says, I got it. Come down and see it. We go down there, and here's this beautiful Escalade, pearl white, mint. It's like maybe two years old, mint. And he says, I'm, I'm sure sorry it took so long. He said, I tried to find a long version for sale, but I couldn't. All I could find is a short one. <laughs> I said, that's exactly what we, help me out, said. We, uh, I'm a pilot. I have a Piper uh, Warrior, a little four-seat trainer. But I wanted a plane to fly places. We do a lot of conferences and things, and so... I didn't want a jet yet because I wanted to be able to fly something. And so we sowed a seed. And I just, there's so many different planes and so many options. I, I couldn't just, I couldn't say, I now knew that I'd have to say that's it. Right? I mean, uh, here's what I say. If you can't see it, you can't seize it. And that was a real problem. I had to pray about it. I said, God, I just can't see it. I, I need a plane. I just can't see the plane. When I see it, I'll know it. I can, you know, I can by faith, receive that. I need some help. That weekend, a guy in my church came to first service, went home, and God spoke to him and said, you need to go back to church at the end of second service and show Pastor Gary the picture of the airplane your friend bought. He said, I just came back. I just came to church. You go back now, go back into that service and show him the plane that your friend bought. So he comes up after service. He goes, Pastor Gary, this is kind of strange. I went home and the Lord said to come back. And I was just supposed to show you this airplane. And it was a Piper Mirage. And for whatever reason, although I fly a Piper Warrior, I had never really considered or looked at the Piper Mirage, which is a high-performance aircraft. It's a piston aircraft flies 25,000 feet, 250 miles an hour. And when I saw it, I knew that it would handle like my Piper. And I said, that is it. We had it within a month. Friend, what I'm selling is putting the sickle in. I can go on and tell you all kinds of stories. And I'll end with this one story. I like how your clock doesn't really move much up there. It's just kind of... Set on 50 minutes and doesn't change. That's good. I like that. <laughs> we have a lot to cover here, anyway. <laughs> That's probably Pastor Tom's invention, that probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the kingdom. Are you getting it? it? Operates by laws. You are a citizen of that kingdom, so you have legal rights. And the Bible says in Hebrews 1.14 that every single angel's job is to work for you. Did you know angels are waiting for you to release heaven? See, I'll be tell you all kinds of stories. Anyway, so back early church, now, Dranda loves children, and your pastors love children, but she, was, uh, she got involved with the, uh, the birthing. You know, she would coach women how to birth babies. She'd go to all, she went, I don't know how many, to 100, maybe 100 births in the church. She'd go with the women, and uh, after they would, uh, what, do you, what do you call it when they take the baby? Um, C-section. She would tell them, you can have a normal birth. And she'd coach them through all that again, you know, all the things. Uh, she was just coaching moms. She wrote a book about it as well. And so this uh, mother in the church, she already had one child, but she decided she'd love to have a home birth. And so that's what they did. And we assigned one of the ladies in the church, uh, a coach, to pray with her. She did have a midwife there, of course. And uh, came time to have the baby. It, uh, I don't know. Babies always come at night sometimes. I don't know why. So we're asleep about 3 in the morning, and the phone rings next to the bed. I pick it up, and all I hear is the, the coach, the person that was praying with the mom, screaming in the phone, please pray, the baby's been born dead. 
Now, instantly, I saw a picture. Pastor encouraging moms for home births has a stillborn. You know, you can see the press doing that, right? And I saw that, and I cast that down. I said, no, we're not going to do that. So we jumped up. We began to pray in the Spirit, jumped in the car, began to head to the hospital. Now, the baby had been taken in a separate ambulance than the mom. The baby was declared dead on arrival when the ambulance came, and the baby was declared dead when it made it to the hospital, which is about 20 minutes from the house. The mom was taken in a separate ambulance to the hospital. Now, we are now driving to the hospital. We're praying in the Spirit because I need to hear what to do. We get about halfway there, and all of a sudden, it's like a wind comes to the car. I look at Drenda at the exact moment she looks at me. I say, or she said first, not just one, that baby's fine. I said, yeah, the baby's perfect. The baby's fine. So now that we've heard God on the topic, I become a spiritual scientist. I'm going to go in the hospital, and I need to find out what happened, what's going on. So we went to the hospital. You would assume that nurses would smile holding babies. We walk in. There's maybe six nurses holding this baby girl who's perfect, pink, crying, perfect. But they're not happy. They have a scowl on every face. I'm like, what is going on? I said, where's the mom at? Where's Jennifer at? They said, oh, she's up in maternity. So Drenda takes off up towards maternity. I stay downstairs. Drenda walks into the maternity ward, and there's Jennifer, the mom. And Drenda walks in and says, Jennifer, I just saw your baby girl. She's perfect. She's healthy. She's perfect. The nurse on duty says, no, that baby's in a body bag. Now, you know there is no nurse, no matter what situation, would be so crude to tell a mom who could have you know, maybe lost a baby at that second, that the baby's in a body bag. You know that was a demon speaking. But then my wife spoke. <laughs> if I could put what happened in this... Now, she didn't hold the key to the baby. The mom did. But yet, she wanted to correct this situation. If you could see her in the spirit realm, here's what it goes. No! You know, she's just going to speak right into, no, that baby's fine. I just saw the baby. The baby's fine. Okay, so the baby's fine. Why is it fine? That's the, I'm a scientist. It was declared dead. It was declared dead at the hospital. But here's alive. Yet I know stories that don't end that well, right? Like the, like the story with the, uh, the, the, you know, the, you know, issue of blood, the woman. So I want to know how or why this baby's alive. I do know it's because of spiritual law, but I need to discern what laws are functioning and who released them, how did they release them. I need to see what happened. I called the coach. I said, Karen, you need to tell me every single thing that happened during that birth. She said, well, the baby was born dead. She had a bunch of aunts and people there. They all started screaming, call 911. And the baby was discolored. It was, born, it was born dead. But she said, Jennifer, the mom, did something. The minute the baby was born, she put her hand over her husband's mouth. Now, her husband worked Sundays. Her husband had not been coming to church to hear how faith works. And she knew that. She put her hand over his mouth and said these words, Don't you say a thing. This baby is fine. Now, the baby is discolored and dead, and she is speaking. See, she's fully persuaded. She just sees a live baby. She also understood spiritual law that the husband is the head of the house, and if he opened his mouth, it'd be over. I said, oh, that's okay. That's interesting. I said, that, that's, that's, that's what saved the baby right there. The baby was taken to the hospital, Declared dead there, but then all of a sudden, it woke up by itself. In fact, the ambulance crew received the run of the year for that run, yet they said, they said, we did nothing. No heart manipulation, no CPR, no oxygen. Said when we got there, the baby was just dead. But the baby woke up. That's a great story, 
of what we're illustrating. Faith, released, jurisdictions, all in that story. But I want, I'm just painting a picture with you how faith works, how the kingdom operates. Right? And then, uh, because this is the last service of the day, correct? We have all day. Okay. <laughs> I do want to show you this one video, then I'm going to pray. About, uh, this is a cool video. We'll take a look at their story. It was uh, 2015. We had just moved back to Atlanta, Georgia from Florida. Our real estate business had just kind of took a turn for the worst. And we had started watching Pastor Gary fix the money thing over the last couple of years. And it was just really intriguing. I said, let's drive up to Ohio and go see Faith Life Church. I just felt like I needed to know that it was real. So we drove up here knowing nobody and we just came to church and it was really a great time. We were getting ready to leave and then we met one of the greeters. He said, hey, you're from here. And I, we told him right here, you drove all the way from Atlanta just to come to church? I said, yep, just wanted to do it. And he said, hey, why don't you, we have a kingdom class. Why don't you come have a kingdom class? We can even at least feed you. You drove from Atlanta. I said, okay. And little did we know, he talked to Pastor Gary and Pastor Drenda, and they were teaching the class that day. And they came over and said, we heard you drove all the way up here just to come to our church. We said, yep. So he prayed for us, and they got ready to walk away. And Pastor Gary said, you're a business manager. I said, yeah. He said, it's going to be your best year ever coming up. So we fast forward and that summer of next year, we said we needed to make a change in our business and change to a different brokerage. So we realized there was this brokerage down the street. So I went down there, so we joined, and it was about 45 days later, we get an email from the company saying, hey, we don't believe in this company no more, we're shutting it down, we're starting our own business, and we were like in a state of shock. What are we gonna do? And we started praying. And I said, okay, I'm getting something from God. And I got an email I feel like from God. And we sent it to the founder of the company and just telling them basically, we love your company. We think it's a great company. We sure hope you keep a company at Alpharetta. Two hours later, he said, how would you like to own a company? Yes. I was like, what? He said, my wife and I were praying when we got your email and it was like God clearly said, these are the ones who should own your company. Mm -hmm. So in 45 days of joining the company, we owned the company. Mm -hmm. And it just like, it was miraculous. We went to lunch a couple of days later and he says, man, you love my company more than we do. He says, why don't you become the franchise director? Now everything goes through you from 45 days we own a real estate company. We now are the directors of it. And fast forward, we now have three offices, a hundred, some, almost 200, close to 200 agents. And we are just having the best year after the best year after the best year. We had just started the one, the first office. And then all of a sudden it was like, I, I was doing some exercises, so I just thought I'd just overdid it a little bit and two weeks later it was still a, uh, something was hurting on my side I said I'm gonna go to the uh, urgent care just to see because it's still hurting and it started from there and went from urgent care to you need to go to the hospital do all these tests and all of that and all the tests and nothing could be found so I had at that point it was like the pain was from here literally all the way down to my toes. He couldn't even hardly touch me. When I Just, would touch her, she would holler as if somebody was beating her. Yes. I would touch her and she would just holler. We couldn't even sleep in the same room because I would accidentally touch her. I had dropped down to uh, 70 pounds. Um, I usually weighed about 140, 150 at the max my whole life. And I dropped down to 70. I couldn't eat. I was in so much pain. And we just started. We got Pastor Amy's book, yep. Healed Overnight. We did the 30-day challenge. Took communion. We took communion every day. But we came into agreement and decided we're moving forward with what God has in store. God has already healed me. 
over 2,000 years ago. It's, it's a finish, it's done. It was just, there was something that was blocking it and it wasn't God. Um, it, was, it was something within me that was the, the moment that I said, I shall live and not die. And that's the first step. I had to make it, have that decision, not only just in my mind, but in my heart. And to know that I know that I know I've already been healed. Progressively, she got her appetite back. Mm -hmm. That was amazing for us, and it gave so much encouragement for our daughter because being a chef, mommy's eating my food again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the more and now she's not stopped eating, and she's just you know, and <laughs> just going more and more. As you see, so I've, I'm about at this point I'm about a, close to 160 pounds. I've gained all my weight back and then some. And I'm so thankful for that in itself. And now I'm not walking with a cane. Kingdom life is for us. And we want to advance. So when Pastor Gary was talking about kingdom advance, we want to advance the kingdom as well. That's part of our mantra, if you will. That's, that's the yeah. purpose. Mm -hmm. our, our lifetime goal is simple. We just simply want to demonstrate and expand the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So simple. Mm -hmm. We've been there when religion didn't work. We've tried and it was not working. And it seemed like things were hopeless. But when we found the kingdom that was always there, it's like now we have an unfair advantage. We feel sorry for the world because they like, they don't have the secret we have. All you need is the kingdom. One experience will change the rest of your life your children's life, and the generations to come. Amen. All right. Okay, stand stand together here today as we close. Get ready to close here. I'm going to pray with you. Um, all, I'm all about demonstrating the kingdom. When I teach, there should be evidence. That's this is how. I've, when they asked me when we launched television 18 years ago, they said, "Why do you want to do television?" I said, "I want to tell stories." I want to teach people the kingdom and I want to prove it. I want to show it to them that they can see how it works and they can see the result. And uh, we've launched the Kingdom Advance, as you heard. And we've launched, now we're in 77 nations. We've taken uh, our kingdom small groups. God said, take them undercover, take them across the world because so many people have never seen what you're seeing today. Religion doesn't see that stuff. And uh, it, it produces hope. It doesn't produce faith to hear a story, but it produces hope. Jesus said these signs will follow them that believe, right? A sign points somewhere. Then they know where the answer is at, and faith can come through learning and hearing, then becoming a student. And uh, that's, that's Drenda, and our, our heart is that, uh, and your pastor's heart, that you get it. You've got a lot of work to do, you know? Um, I mean, there's so much, so much, so much there that you can step into.